Am I ready to begin? Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for having me. It's a privilege. Uh, I'm also especially honored to be the, the first speaker, and I will try to do right by that trust that you put into me. So I want to talk today about uh, the rational origins of conflict, and specifically we'll be talking about the uh, question, why would two rational leaders, more or less rational leaders, fight a war? Uh, now, just so you know some background on myself, I think, as I probably mentioned in the introduction, my background is in game theory. So I study on um, bargaining models of violent conflict. And um, so that this is just going to be a quick overview of how people in my niche of global science think about this question. But I think it has some broad implications, and I hope it's, I hope it's helpful to you. All right, so why would two more or less rational leaders uh, fight a war? Now, first, we have to do some preliminaries about what we mean by that word rational. So by rational, I think we can often connote like reasonable or good or just or something like that. Uh, when we mean when we study the word rational here in political science and economics, we don't uh, mean anything about good or just. So we're setting aside concerns of whether uh, an act of behavior is uh, morally valuable or anything when we talk about rationality. So rationality does not mean good or just. And in fact, some historians, when they talk about Hitler, who obviously was neither good nor just, would refer to him as having a methodical madness. So given his underlying ambitions were in fact crazy, that's that, metho that madness part, but given those ambitions, he was often remarkably efficient and even single-minded in his pursuit of them. So that's that methodical, that rational side of his leadership. So we're divorcing any kind of moral content from the word rational. By rational, we also don't mean that you're operating under anything like complete information. So saying more someone is more or less irrational doesn't mean that they have lots of knowledge, they don't have lots of information about their situation. It's perfectly possible to make rational decisions under extreme uncertainty. And a classic example here would be rational gambling. For instance, if I were to offer to charge you $10 to flip a coin, heads, I pay you $30, tails, I pay you nothing, it would be perfectly rational to take that bet, even though you're operating under uncertainty. So you don't need to have any uh, substantial amount of information to be called rational. When we talk about rationality and rational relations, we basically mean the following. So these are our criteria for evaluating whether someone's rational. First, to be rational, you have to have goals. So a leader needs to be trying to achieve something. They're not just surviving from day to day or behaving out of habit. Second, uh, to be rational, you need to be able to rank these goals from most to least valuable. So you can have lots of competing goals, but as long as you're always able to compare your goals and make a clear list of priorities, you still count as rational. Third, a leader needs to be pursuing these goals as the best way they know how, again, more or less, given their incomplete knowledge. They may be mistaken about the best way to pursue their goals, but nonetheless, they're tr still trying to achieve their goals in the most effective way they know how. And again, they might be mistaken in that belief, but given what they, the knowledge that they're acting upon, they're going about it as effectively as they know how. And finally, they update their um, incomplete beliefs accurately in response to new information. That's obviously the most subjective of these criteria, but when we are dealing with it in um, sort of more abstract context, it's usually not a problem. Now, given these criteria, that you have to have goals, that you have to be able to rank these goals, that you have to pursue these goals as effectively as you know how, and that you update your beliefs accurately in response to, to new information, given these criteria, we can now sketch what it would mean for a leader to be irrational. So most obviously an irrational leader is one who is not goal oriented. Instead of having clear objectives, a leader might run from one idea to the other and back, or he might simply behave out of habit or do whatever his advisors are telling him to do on a given day. Such a leader isn't rational because such a leader isn't oriented around a set of objectives, around a set of goals. So that's the easiest way that someone's not, not rational. However, even if a leader does have goals, he can still be irrational. He can have vague, or confused priorities. So if he has lots of goals and they're all jumbled up together and they don't make any sense and you can't disentangle them, well, if he can't prioritize them, he's not rational. Likewise, if his goals are too vague or too poorly defined to give him clear direction, he's not rational, etc. Third, he could be sloppy or emotional in pursuit of his goals. So if he lets his emotions or his ego or his narcissism get in the way of the pursuit of his ambitions, uh, then he would be irrational. So even if he knows what he ought to be doing, if he doesn't obey cold-blooded reason, if he instead just follows his emotions, he doesn't count as rational. 
And finally, and this is probably the one that you most often see in international relations, a leader might be so stubborn, pardon, a leader might be so stubborn or pig-headed that he ignores new information, or he just believes what he wants to believe. He's guilty of wishful thinking rather than what the evidence is telling him. So if someone's ignoring new information or just believing what they want to believe because the reality is too horrifying to, for them to confront it, that person will also count as irrational. Now, of course, nobody is actually rational, not even Otto von Bismarck. We all make these kinds of mistakes that you see on the slide there, and we make them often. But some people are more rational than others. You could probably name some of your friends who are more rational and some of your friends perhaps who are less rational. And the same seems to be true of leaders, that it makes sense to treat some leaders as more or less rational and other leaders as decidedly irrational. And once we are looking at those rational leaders, we can ask, well, why are they still fighting wars? Now, if you'd like to pursue these ideas further, I have three suggested readings for you here. Uh, the first is Bruce Bueno de Mesquita's The Dictator's Handbook, uh, which I highly recommend. And I believe uh, Professor Cudelia also highly recommends it. Uh, it's very readable, and it presents many ideas from advanced political science in a format that's meant to be accessible to anyone who's pretty intelligent and interested in politics. Uh, one warning, though, as you can probably tell from the title, the book is very cynical uh, and even Machiavellian. So just be aware that uh, it's more, it's, uh, I don't know, it might be, not be a very moral book, but it is a very insightful book. The second is an article by James Firon, Rationalist Explanations for War. Now, much of today's lecture is just going to be a condensed version of that article. For many years, this was the most cited article in all of international relations. It radically changed the way we study war, and it basically founded a lot um, of the game theoretic study of conflict. The last work you see on this slide there is if you want to do a deeper dive into the topic, uh, once you've covered the basics, it's by Harrison Wagner, War and the State. And it ties a lot of modern political science back to its antecedents in economics and in political philosophy. So especially if you're interested in like the broader raison d'etat tradition that comes out of Machiavelli and Cardinal Richelieu and people like them, uh, that book takes their ideas and puts them in a context of modern political science. Now, one last thing, all these works, of course, are well worth reading, but they all owe an essential debt to one thinker, and that is uh, Karl, Karl von Clausewitz. Um, some of you may have, have probably encountered Clausewitz before. He wrote the book on war, probably the most celebrated book on the topic ever written. All modern rationalist inquiries, and that includes all the game theoretic work I do, all of it goes back to Clausewitz. So even though he's not a game theorist himself, uh, we are all building on his ideas. Uh, especially this idea, which I put on the screen there for you, which I'm sure you've heard before, war is merely the continuation of politics by other means. And Clausewitz's long book is one long exploration of what that famous insight means. And we are still mining his book for ideas today. He casts a long shadow and I highly recommend him to you. All right. With those preliminaries aside, let me turn to the bulk of the lecture. So why would two more or less rational leaders go to war? And where I wanna go with this question, so here's an outline for the lecture today. Uh, first, I wanna dispense with some wrong answers. It's easy to think that the, these wrong answers are rational explanations for war, but they aren't. They don't actually make sense. And then I want to pose the right question. Why couldn't these states just bargain instead? And once we pose the question that way, it becomes clear that rational explanations for war can take only of a few, one of a few well-defined forms. And I've listed those forms for you here on the outline slide, and we'll be walking through each of them just with a couple minutes apiece. Finally, I want to round out the lecture with just some quick implications. What logically follows when war tracks one of these patterns rather than another? All right, so that's where we're going with the rest of the time I've got. So here, first are some wrong answers. One wrong answer, the aggressor calculated that the benefits outweighed the cost. This is the most commonly offered rational explanation for war, but it doesn't work. Why not? Well, he forgot about opportunity costs. Even if the benefits of war outweigh the costs of war, which sometimes is the case, is it still better than the alternative? Getting what you want without fighting? Probably not. More on this in a minute. A second a possible wrong answer is, well, the, ex the aggressor expected to win. This is also unsatisfying. Why? Well, what did the other guy expect? If you have the same expectations about how war is likely to go, he wins, I lose, or I win, he loses, you should be able to avoid it. 
war doesn't really make sense unless your explanation, your expectations about it aren't aligned. Lastly, what if the aggressor, you say like the aggressor wanted something the other guy had? Again, this sounds obvious, but it's not actually, it doesn't actually work to explain war between rational leaders. Because it doesn't answer a basic question, oh, why couldn't you negotiate with the victim instead? Which gets us to the big question about war, the right question about rational war, which is why couldn't the leaders have bargained instead? A war is costly. It destroys part of the thing that both leaders want. Therefore, there is always a bargain that both leaders would prefer to war. Even when one side comes out ahead from a conflict, it could have done even better if it had gotten all those spoils of victory without having to waste all the blood and treasure to achieve them. There's always a bargain that both leaders prefer to war. Therefore, to explain war between rational leaders is to explain why they could not agree on such a bargain. Let me repeat this because this is the foundation of all game theoretic bargaining models of conflict. All rationalist explanations for war go back to this insight. To explain war between rational leaders is to explain why they could not agree to a bargain. All right, so now let's look at some possible explanations that are uh, capable of explaining war between two rational leaders. So the, the logic here of rationalist explanations for is, I think, pretty obvious to see. And let me take an example from American history, which may be familiar to some of you. Uh, you don't need to know any American history to appreciate the example. So in the 1800s, the United States and Great Britain couldn't agree about how to divide the Oregon Territory. Um, Oregon stretched at that time from California all the way up to Alaska. So it was a very large territory and very valuable. Uh, in fact, in the 1840s, the United States president sent threatening messages to Great Britain, basically telling them to get out of the territory. We had the legal right to it. Uh, and in response, Britain began naval preparations for war. So it looked like the United States and Great Britain were going to fight yet another war uh, early on in our history. But then the whole crisis blew over. And the reason is they found a bargain. So suppose that this line is what they're bargaining over and America would have say a 60% chance of winning the war. Suppose also that if America wins the war, it could just take whatever it wants, in this case, the entire Oregon territory. Likewise, suppose that uh, Britain would have a 40% chance of winning and taking Oregon. But what you'll note here is that in some sense, America expects to win and, Oregon, and Britain expects to lose. But what really is going to matter is their relative percentages, not who's above 50% and below it. Now, and suppose also that, of course, war is costly, so that the, in terms of lives lost and the devastation, devastation to the land, the expense of bullets, amount to, say, 1 20th of the total value of Oregon to America and to Britain. Well, to avoid war, any bargain has to offer America at least 55% of the total, and it would have to offer Britain at least 35% of the total, and which you probably I'm sure already noticed five minutes ago, this is always possible. There's always a bargain that both leaders would prefer to war. And that's easy to see on the line. America would demand this much, Britain would demand this much, and of course there's some surplus left over that can make the, for a bargain more attractive than fighting to both of them. And that's exactly what happened. So here's the Oregon territory, the disputed territory is mostly that green area, but then Britain was actually by the end of the conflict uh, making claims about all the territory, all the way down there to California, to the modern, the, the Spanish-American border there, which is now modern day California. The United States as part of this bargain got the most valuable parts of the Oregon territory, the part that includes modern day Seattle and the rich agricultural lands of Washington state, which is where we get a lot of our um, fruit here in this country. And Britain got the Northern part of the territory and guaranteed maritime access to modern day Victoria. So they found a bargain. They basically split the territory roughly in proportion to the odds that America would win the war versus the odds that Britain would win the war. Now, so far, I assume all this is pretty obvious. But asking the question, why couldn't they bargain instead, allows us to weed out lots of explanations that don't, in fact, make logical sense because they don't answer the underlying problem. Why couldn't they agree to a bargain? Again, it should always exist because even if the spoils of war make war, make war worth it, there should still be a bargain because peace would have been even more profitable. All right, so why couldn't they agree? This is the first and most common rationalist explanation for war, mutual optimism. They disagree about what would happen in the event of war. In some sense, they both expect to win. There's a kind of mutual optimism about how the war would go. And of course, they can't both be right. In this situation, they can't reach a bargain because they disagree about how big a share each person is entitled to. Incidentally, game theory has managed to show that disagreement about resolve 
can't be sufficient to cause war. It has to be a disagreement about your relative odds of victory. Now that raises the question, how do states come to disagree about their odds of victory? Well, the obvious way. Each has private information about his capabilities. He knows how many troops he has. He knows any secret weapons he's developed, etc. And it's not surprising that two leaders, each of them with lots and lots of secret intelligence, come to different conclusions about their relative strength. When they reach those different conclusions, you get war. And of course, each has incentives to lie to each other. So to avoid war, I might want to tell my enemy, believe me, I am much stronger than you think I am. But what's the problem? If you were weak, you'd say the same thing. The only way to call someone's bluff uh, is to throw down. The only way to say, tell someone's bluffing is to actually start fighting. So it's hard to actually figure out, well, who's in, uh, whose perceptions are wrong without actually beginning to shoot at each other. Now, before I move on, I want to mention a paradox here about this explanation for war. Uh, you don't need to know this, but it might be of interest to those of you with math or econ, um, economics backgrounds, or those of you who, um, who like poker. So back in the 1970s, Robert Allman managed to prove that two rational people can't truly agree to disagree. If I know that you disagree with me, then I have reason to doubt my own beliefs. And so do you. If you iterate this self-doubt uh, often enough, the two rational people should always end up roughly agreeing. And if you've ever played poker, you've experienced this. The very fact that another player is still in the game against you is a warning to you. It means that your hand is probably not as strong as you think it is. Uh, Robert Allman incidentally won the Nobel Prize for this discovery. For war, what this means is that any leader who goes to war and who expects to win, and who also knows that his enemy expects to win, probably is a little bit irrational. If I expect to win, and I know the other guy also expects to win, that should be telling me that one of us is wrong and it might very well be me. So the very fact that we both know we're optimistic should make both of us less optimistic. You can see this logic, I think, again, pretty well using that chart from a few slides ago. So if we reconsider that Oregon example, imagine now that Britain thinks it has a 60% chance of victory, then there's no way for America and Britain to bargain. America wants 55%, Britain wants 55%, and so there's no longer any surplus. There's no longer a way to reach a mutually beneficial bargain. That would leave us both better off. So in that situation where we both expect to win, you get war. That's the first major rationalist explanation for war. The second rational explanation for war is indivisible goods. And this sounds a bit jargony, but it actually makes a lot of intuitive sense. In this situation, two leaders can't bargain because dividing the good that they're arguing about would itself destroy the good's value. And the classic example here is Jerusalem, which is on the slide there. Trying to divvy it up between the Israelis and Palestinians, much less dividing the Temple Mount, would destroy its value. It wouldn't be Jerusalem anymore. So they can't argue because if they tried to split up the good, it would destroy the good's value to both of them. There's something intuitively appealing, I think, about this explanation, um, but be careful. It's not clear how convincing it should be. After all, why can't they just make side payments to each other? So for instance, if Jerusalem is worth a trillion dollars to the Israelis and a trillion dollars to the Palestinians, well, why can't the Israelis just compensate the Palestinians for their share or vice versa and call it a day? Now that sounds a little bit far-fetched, but that's exactly how America got Florida. Uh, we were bickering with the Spanish because Florida wasn't really valuable to us unless we got all of it and we wanted all of it and the, uh, the Spanish didn't want to give us all of it. And so finally we ended up just paying them a huge pot of money and saying, thank you, Florida is now ours and, Spanish said, and, and the Spanish renounced all claim to it. So it seems like with a lot of indivisible goods, there should be a possibility of making side payments unless there's something about the good itself that means like if you were to like pay for your part of Jerusalem, you would just totally lose any credibility with your domestic political audience. So we usually think that indivisible goods need to be combined with some other problem, some other obstacle to peace to really explain war. That's the second explanation. The third is the most important of all, which is, uh, the changes in the balance of power. Fundamentally, two leaders might not agree to a bargain because one doesn't trust the other to honor the bargain. After all, in international politics, words are cheap and history is littered with broken promises. 
In fact, I dare say if you were to count up all the treaties that have ever been made, probably a strict majority of them have been broken. Now, why don't you trust the other guy? Importantly, it is not enough to say, I don't trust the other guy because he's a liar. Why is that unsatisfying? Well, even a liar has an incentive to keep his promise if you've reached a bargain that is better for, war, uh, for you than war. So if you've given the person more than he expects to get out of a conflict, even a liar will still honor his agreement. So it's not enough to say, I don't trust him because he's, he's a liar. Likewise, it's not enough to say, I don't trust him because he covets my stuff. Because he, again, even a greedy man, if he's getting more out of a bargain than he could get there from conflict, even a greedy man won't renege on the bargain. There's really only one rational reason not to trust someone to honor their part of their agreement, and that is that power is changing. He's, one side is going to be stronger tomorrow than it is today. And as a result, that person will then be able to overthrow the bargain that they agreed to in the past. One side will be stronger in the future. When that side grows more powerful, he will be in a position to make additional demands. And we call this the shadow of a power transition. When this happens, it's rational for one leader to fight today when he's strong, rather than wait until tomorrow when he will be weak. And this is related to the famous problem of appeasement. And I couldn't resist putting Churchill on the slides. You've probably heard this line before. Uh, Churchill famously said, an appeaser is one who feeds a crocodile, hoping it will eat him last. He's saying it's foolish to negotiate a peace if that peace will allow your enemy to grow stronger. Why? Because once your enemy is stronger, he's going to come back and demand more. It's better to fight him when you uh, are at least are, are relatively strong than when he's gained an advantage over you. Better to fight him now when you have a chance than submit tomorrow. And we say that power, the, uh, the changes in the balance of power, are the most important rational cause of war, because they are the explanation for most of the major wars in history. Let me go through this chart real fast. So as you can see here, you know, uh, it's in English, but uh, I think many of y'all read English. And uh, even if not, you can tell the flags there. So a lot of the worst wars in history have been direct consequences of power transitions. So here you've got like the Habsburgs and the Swedes. And of course that causes the 30 years war, which kills 8 million Europeans at a time when Europe had 75 million people. So roughly 10% of Europe is a uh, casualty, sorry, not kills, they're casualties, uh, is a casualty in the 30 years war, which is mostly driven by a power transition. Then of course you have the conflicts between the French and the British and things like the seven years war, uh, which um, the United States uh, calls the French and Indian war, but it was such a large world war that was reaching even North America. Uh, then of course you have the Napoleonic Wars, the Crimean War, and most, uh, of course, most famously of all, the two world wars. So when we think of the worst wars in history, the Thirty Years War, the Napoleonic Wars, the world wars, almost all of them are driven by power transitions. About one country rising up in power and another country or set of countries declining, and then the need to fight for why you're strong rather than wait. Uh, until you are weak. That leads us to a fourth explanation for a war between rational leaders, which is strategic goods. These are things that both sides value in themselves, but these goods also affect their bargaining power. And when a good is strategic, the leaders can't bargain because redistributing the good that they're bargaining over will change their bargaining power. So trying to bargain will induce a power transition. In this situation, the weaker side can't make a concession, even if it might like to make a concession, because making a concession would empower its enemy to make further demands. And the classic example here, which I put on the slide, is the Sudetenland. So Hitler wanted the region, certain regions of Czechoslovakia that had um, a large proportion of, um, of German nationals in them. Now, of course, it just happened to be that those sections of Czechoslovakia were industrially and strategically valuable. And as Churchill foresaw at the time, and as we know in retrospect, what Hitler was really interested in uh, was gaining those industrial and strategic resources, which would then allow him to conquer Czechoslovakia without much of a fight and put him in a better position to start the Second World War. So you're afraid of giving people uh, a, a larger share of the good because that will affect their bargaining power. It will create a power transition, which as you know from the previous slide, is the worst cause of war of them all. All right, that's strategic goods. Another possibility 
um, and this is more recently come to the fore in the literature on this question, is the future cost of armor. In this situation, rational leaders can't bargain because maintaining their arsenals might be more expensive than eliminating an enemy. Now recall that a bargain exists because not fighting is cheaper than fighting. But what if that's not the case anymore? Now it can be very expensive to maintain your current power position for decades and decades and decades. It might just be cheaper to fight now and destroy your enemy rather than spend enormous sums of money to maintain a strong enough arsenal to keep your bargaining uh, power in the same place. For instance, this is on the left there is a chart of American military spending. If you're not aware, the United States spends more on its military than all the next nine countries uh, top spenders put together. So, and that's a, that costs a lot of money. And here in this country, we're always arguing about how much money we're spending on the military and couldn't we be spending on other things like social security or Medicare. So it's very expensive to maintain your bargaining power and your uh, situation in international relations. On the right there, you have a picture from the Iran-Iraq war. Um, it's, the Iran-Iraq war seems to have begun at least in part from this logic that Saddam Hussein thought it would be cheaper to eliminate the Ayatollahs rather than engage in a long and costly rivalry. So after the Iranian revolution, he can see that Iran is going to be a serious threat to his regime. And he's got this moment of opportunity and he decides to exploit it. He says it'd just be cheaper to wipe out the Iranians in the next couple of years rather than have to try to coexist with them for 20 years and constantly spend more and more and more to maintain my deterrent. Uh, interestingly, after the war that began, the Ayatollahs came to the same conclusion about Saddam Hussein. Uh, they also decided that it would just be cheaper to eliminate him rather than try to reach a peaceful agreement with him. The Iran-Iraq war is one of the worst wars of the 20th century, which obviously has got a lot of competition for that title. Uh, it only ends because the United States uh, gets into the conflict and basically says, you guys have to stop, uh, have to stop this. So both decide it would just be cheaper to eliminate the other rather than to sustain the costs of a long-term rivalry. All right, the last explanation I wanna to do today for uh, why two rational leaders would go to war is called diversionary war. Again, for a bargain to be attractive to both rational leaders, war has to be more costly than peace. But what if war benefits a leader domestically? Everything that I've talked about so far assumes that a war is costly. But what if, uh, for some reason, war is creating benefits for one of the parties, rather than net costs? There's a well-known effect in political science called rally around the flag. And this is when people tend to support leaders they ordinarily wouldn't, because they feel their nation is under attack and needs to rally together. Now that sounds like a great thing, right? Except that a Machiavellian, a Machiavellian leader can use that to his advantage. He can try to distract his people from domestic problems by starting a war abroad. In this case, peace might be more costly to that leader uh, from his perspective, because peace entails having to face up to all the domestic problems he's dealing with, uh, rather than distract his population with conflict abroad. The classic example of diversionary war is the Falkland Islands. So on the left here, you have a chart of Ar the Argentinian economy. And the right is just a picture from, the, uh, is just a painting from the conflict. So Argentina was ruled by a military junta that had seized power. What you can see here is that for a long time, like the previous 180 years of its history, the Argentinians had been getting steadily richer and richer and richer. Then that military junta comes to power. It mismanages the country, as you probably know, it's always a bad idea to be ruled by a military junta. The economy starts to plateau, and then they actually start to regress. So things are looking really bad for the Argentinians and things are getting really unstable for the regime. Now they could have a couple options here. They could try to reform the regime. They could institute democratic reforms, allow for more elections, try to reduce corruption, but all of that would jeopardize their power. And so instead, what do they do? They start a war with Britain. So these uh, steady problems mount for them and they begin a war with Britain to try to distract the Argentinians uh, with a conflict abroad. Unfortunately, they miscalculate on the British response. Uh, the British fought back ferociously under Margaret Thatcher, and this turned out to be a pretty serious uh, miscalculation for the Argentinian regime, but they didn't know that going into the conflict. Um, I'm coming to the end of these explanations. Should I pause for questions, if anybody has questions on any of these? All right, well, I'll, I'll wrap up then with some oh. implications. Sorry, yes. Can I, yeah, okay. Uh, so can we think is, uh, 
one uh, at, at, at one uh, reason why uh, but uh, the war is that the people want want war if uh, for example russia when putin uh, attacked ukraine uh, they support uh, they supported him more than uh, early can we can we think that uh, yes so two things could be going on in such a situation so if we uh, treat the people as rational then we have all the same problems we've already dealt with like why are the people wanting to fight a war rather than just trying to find a negotiated settlement where they get all the spoils of war without having to explain expend the blood pressure so if the people are rational all the explanations that we've just kicked discussed kick in and you need to sort of pick from one of those um if the people though are irrational then what you've got is three players in this situation. You've got the two leaders and you've got an international public pushing its leader in a bad direction. Uh, in that situation, we would say like, we're no longer in the world of rational war. We've entered the world of irrational war. And that leader is just having to respond to irrational incentives coming at him from, um, from his population. Does that, does that clarify it? Yeah, yeah, Cleo, thank you. Thank you for the answer. I see another hand up here. For... Is it Anna? Мене питання українською, якщо ви не проти. Мене питання таке. От, наприклад, я вже міжнародником навчаюсь другий рік, і от, якщо чесно, навіть після вашої чудесної лекції. Я все ж не бачу сенсу і вигоди у війні Росії проти України, адже вони вкладають величезні кошти, ресурси, вони стали ворогом для всього світу, але при цьому вони не відмовляються від цілі, яка в принципі зараз вже для них майже недосяжна. Чому вони не підуть на поступки задля того, аби все ж Ну, хоч якось залишити ту Росію, яку вони мали до цього, а не остаточно знищити власну країну. У мене якось таке питання. I'm going to need a translation, I'm afraid. Yeah. Sergey, are you there? Uh, Anastasia, is Sergey there? I, I'm afraid I can't understand the question without an interpreter. I, I think I think we have yes. problems let with. Me, uh, let me, uh, Richard. Okay. Let me let me translate. Sorry, um, so sure. you, you would have to switch uh, between translations there, but it's okay. You have a translation uh, symbol there, so you can switch to English, and then you can hear the translation. Um, so the question was about the rationality of Russia, and uh, the student asked you uh, that even though you explained. Um, everything very well uh, as far as the rational explanations of the war are concerned, she still doesn't understand the uh, reasoning behind Russia's war because even though they would not be able to achieve goals that they set for themselves, uh, as you remember, Putin said that they will uh, basically denazify, demilitarize Ukraine. Uh, he wanted to conquer most of Ukraine, uh, remove the government. Now it's clear it's not going to happen, but they're still fighting the war and they are mobilizing their people to fight the war. So it seems like what he's doing is completely irrational because it's clear he cannot achieve his goals. And please wait with the, the answer because then I'll have to switch the translation to Ukraine. Sorry about that. All right.
All right, let me try to, uh, to answer that. So there are a couple of possibilities. The first might be that Putin is not a rational actor. So everything that we've talked about so far today is that uh, assumes that both leaders are rational. And it might be the situation that Vladimir Putin is not a rational actor. And I think the, the lecture next week will deal with that possibility. Um, but let's first in the moment assume that he is a rational actor and sort of ask what he might be after. Um, I'll deal with this a bit on the next slide, but uh, so my personal research is actually about how once wars begin, can the war itself introduce new reasons for fighting? And so once the uh, war begins, you can actually get reasons that weren't there before the conflict began that rationally keep um, people fighting. And the answer seems to be yes. So I think that's one possibility is that once you get involved in a conflict, um, there become more rational incentives for you to keep it going. And I think that's, we can probably see that pretty clearly with Putin, that uh, he clearly would face massive domestic pushback if he, uh, if he withdraws from the conflict uh, in a way that could compromise his regime. And so he's gonna face huge costs um, from any sort of loss. And that's unfortunately going to push him to continue fighting. And that's gonna be a rational reason as well. So I'd say that's one thing at stake, that he's put himself in a position where he can't back down uh, without, uh, without compromising his position domestically. Um, uh, another one uh, might be that he got into the uh, conflict with an excess of optimism, which I think is clearly the case. He um, clearly underestimated Ukraine and is now having to rapidly reassess his own capabilities in proportion to uh, Ukrainian capabilities. And I think once that he completes that reassessment, we might, that might cause some reason for optimism for a peaceful uh, settlement. So um, we might not just not have reached the, uh, that, that point yet. So I would say that again, there are two possibilities. One, he could just be an irrational actor. I think given Putin's track record, that's probably not a safe assumption. He seems fairly rational to me. So I think what the likelier explanation is he's put himself in a bad situation where he's now radically increased the costs he would have to pay for any loss. And so even though the war is no longer worth it to him, uh, he can't get out, he can't extricate himself um, without making it going into an even worse situation. That would be my guess. But uh, again, this is, it's easy for me not to say that here in Texas. Um, I'm not experiencing the conflict. Any other questions before I do the last slide? All right, well, let me wrap up with some implications. So based on the different kinds of war, uh, that uh, different patterns that war might have taken, you can make different impl uh, drawn implications about how long it's likely to last, how bad it's likely to be. So for instance, if you think that the causal origins of the war is a result of mutual optimism, then the war should be short. Uh, it should be short after all, because uh, rational leaders and sometimes irrational uh, ones will learn very quickly from battlefield defeats. It's pretty easy to think of yourself much stronger than you are when you're not actually putting that strength to the test. But when that strength gets put to the test, it becomes pretty obvious pretty fast who is actually stronger, uh, how good your weapons are, how well they've been maintained, how well your troops will fight. Uh, just like in poker, when you show your cards, it becomes obvious who is holding the better hand. Uh, in war, it becomes pretty obvious who is holding the better hand. And so if mutual optimism is the reason that war began, war should in general not last that long, unless a new reason for fighting has been introduced, as I just talked about with uh, the answer to your question. Uh, if war is a diversionary war, then we get into a realm of greater uncertainty you would probably expect it to last basically until it becomes costlier than the domestic political benefits it generates. So, you're, you got, uh, so the, such a leader got into this war because it's improving his domestic political position and how long it will last will probably vary by circumstances. So if his domestic population is paying a lot of the price of the war because the war is now being fought on his own territory or they're losing a lot of men or that's making serious economic cost, then diversionary war would be very short because any benefit it's supposed to be gaining and distracting the public is being outweighed by ruining the economy or killing uh, large parts of the population. But if a diversionary war is not being fought in this territory and it's being fought not with his own troops, then you would expect diversionary war to last a long time because it's continuing to generate those domestic political benefits and the domestic political costs are relatively minor. Lastly, uh, if war results in a change, uh, from a change of a prospective change in the balance of power, then as you saw in those earlier slides, war is going to last a long time and be extremely brutal. Since the purpose of the war is to stop your opponent, your enemy from rising in power, 
to fight a war while you're still strong before you grow and weak, then the war will probably last until one side crushes the other. If you recall from that earlier slide, I pointed out the worst world wars in world history have mostly been from power transitions. And you may have noticed that a large percentage of them, like the world wars or the Napoleonic Wars, ended in the total destruction, sorry, the total surrender, and in some cases, the total destruction of at least one of the belligerents. So in the case of the Napoleonic Wars, Poland ceases to exist. Uh, and Napoleon, of course, his entire regime is destroyed and the victorious powers reinstitute um, a, a French government of their own choosing. In the World Wars, even more dramatically, the United States forces Germany into unconditional surrender. Uh, we uh, bomb most of the country into smithereens, and then we replace the government with a government of our own choosing. We do the same in Japan, of course, with the dropping of the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And to this day, Germany and Japan have been not denied entry to the first rank of world powers because we've just totally decided or wanted to prevent them from ever rising in power again. So wars driven by changes in the balance of power tend to be the worst, they tend to last the longest, and they tend to be the most total in their outcomes. Uh, this should be troubling, I think, because if such wars are in some sense rational, and this whole lecture has been about the rational origins of conflict, then it can't be called a mistake. Now, if I'm wrong or unjust, because remember, we were sort of divorcing concerns of rationality from concerns of morality and justice, but it's not a mistake. Given a person's goals, given a person's ambitions, that conflict was in their interest. It was sort of like makes sense as the, uh, as the tool to use to achieve their objectives which means it's not easy to avoid such wars uh, or end them once they've begun. And I think I'll end there and take any questions you may have. Thank you very much for your attention. And if somebody could tell me where the translation button is, I'd like. Так, можна, да, і в мене є одне таке питання. Ми дійшли висновку, що агресора потрібно зупиняти, ну, буквально там відразу, щоб війна не мала такий як масовий характер. Чому тоді багато європейських лідерів, хоч і не відкрито, але, наприклад, намагаються домовитися там з Путіном або вести якісь переговори, хоча Це виглядає не досить раціонально, тому що нам треба завершити, але вони все-таки намагаються домовлятися. Okay, Richard, do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, sir. Sorry, I'm sorry, not. Okay. I, I don't know my way around Zoom well enough to know where this translation button is. So I apologize. Yes, so there is a there is a translation button here. It says called interpretation, and if you just switch to English, then you would hear it. But oh, it's okay. perfect. Okay, I found it. Yeah, but I can translate it right now. So um, the student asks the question about the power balance, and she says that if we all agree that the aggressor um, should be stopped uh, before acquiring additional um, strength through conquest, um, then why, um, as Churchill suggests, then why are foreign powers now, European uh, countries, are why are they negotiating or trying to negotiate with Putin on the end of this war, if all they need to do is to continue fighting the war in order to, as you said, fully destroy Russia and fully destroy Putin? so that the aggressor would be uh, destroyed before he gains more power? Yes, a great question. There are several things going on there. And, so and first, wait uh, five seconds before I... Okay, <laughs> yes. All right, that's a great question. There are several things going on in it that I want to address. So first on the matter of strategic goods, it seems clear to me that Crimea is one of the most valuable strategic territories on earth. And I think the, um, I think the Western powers made a pretty clear blunder in allowing its acquisition uh, back in 2014, because it was obviously just going to, to strengthen the Russian hand going forward. 
um, that it wasn't just a merely like, a, uh, it wasn't just a concession that could be a one-time concession, but it was a concession that was going to improve his bargaining power, which meant that a further conflict was going to become more likely. And I think that's true of a lot of the regions that you see there in Eastern uh, and Southern Ukraine, that a lot of them are strategic goods. And so to uh, negotiate over them uh, is to improve the opponent, the enemy's bargaining power over time. So yes, I think your concern is right. Uh, why are the Europeans so willing to negotiate over it? Um, I see a couple of possibilities. So first, again, they could be irrational. They could not realize that these are strategic goods. After all, the, um, the Europeans also gave Hitler the Sudetenland, uh, failing to recognize that uh, acquisition of this territory would improve his bargaining position and make war more, more likely in the future. So one possibility is they don't appreciate the situation. Um, another possibility is they have short time horizons. Uh, so it might be rational for a leader who only expects to be in power for five years um, to negotiate peace during those five years and push the problem off onto somebody else's uh, plate so that he doesn't have to deal with it. And there's a certain rationality behind that, even though it is uh, cowardly. Um, and, and another possibility is there might be a hope that while strategic, um, these territories aren't strong enough to actually cause conflict in the future. So they only make a very small increase in Russian power in the future rather than a large increase. I'm afraid I don't know the situation well enough to know whether that's an accurate or inaccurate perception of the situation. Does that answer the question? Or does that answer it, but address it? <laughs> yes, I hear you now, Siri. Anna Cecilia. Ah, yeah. Yes, I hear. Oh, sorry, two Anastasias. Yeah, okay, I understand. Anastasia Hrenyuk, okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know what you can hear me. Uh, okay. But I have a question. I You mentioned, obviously, like, it's hard to make any predictions now, but I heard you mention the term short war, and that uh, there's going to be a short war. How short are we talking? Uh, because like we've seen wars like in Georgia, but we've seen a lot of frozen conflicts. So what do you think about it? Thank you. Um, so I, I must first say, I, I'm not an expert. So this is my informed professional opinion, but not my, but I'm not an expert on the region. So uh, take this with a grain of salt. I don't think that, uh, I think I'm worried that there's that one reason that's driving Putin's behavior is that he expects to grow weaker and steadily weaker in the years ahead. That Russia's facing serious demographic problems. Uh, it's probably stronger now than it will be in five years, let alone 10 or 20. And if that means that the war is being driven in part by a shift in power, then I would expect it to, uh, to last longer rather than shorter. So that's one reason that I would have for pessimism. For optimism, I think it's pretty clear that Putin grossly overestimated his abilities uh, in comparison to the Ukrainians. And if that's the main factor driving the conflict, we should expect the war to be short. I don't know what the balance of these causes is. Again, I'm not expert enough to, to venture too strong an opinion. Um, but from your own perspectives, you could probably say like, to what extent was this conflict driven by uh, misperception by Vladimir Putin? To what extent is it driven by long-term changes in the balance of power in the region? And that should allow you to decide what's the likelihood of this being a short rather than a long conflict if it is predominantly a rational conflict. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Anna, am I pronouncing it right? Is it is it Yana, Anna? No, I've made a question. Щодо того, sure. от зараз ми бачимо, що Росія почала мобілізацію і погрози щодо використання їхньої зброї ще більше погіршилися. Як ви гадаєте, чи є взагалі шанс того, що їхні погрози приведуть до якоїсь дії? Чи це все просто, скажімо так, погрози для, не так як для України, а більше для всього світу в плані того, що Росія просто боючись програти зараз намагається залякати інших і змусити Україну все ж здатися. Чи є такий варіант і чи використають вони все ж ту обіцяну зброю?
Okay. Um, I, again, I will say that I'm not I'm not an expert on the region, Dr. Cudelia. Uh, I would trust his judgment far than my, than my own, but I will give you my professional opinion, which is um, in in international relations, just like in poker, it is always rational to bluff sometimes. If you're never bluffing, you're playing the game wrong. So I am certain that sometimes Russia is bluffing, just as I'm certain that sometimes America is bluffing and sometimes China is bluffing. In fact, a lot of times China is bluffing, um, but sometimes they're not bluffing. And as we talked about earlier on the slide, the only way ultimately to tell whether someone is bluffing is to call the bluff, which is a rather frightening situation. Uh, and the matter of nuclear weapons, I, so I've seen this thrown around a lot. I would expect Russia to do chemical weapons before going nuclear. So I think that they, would, um, that they wouldn't, unless they're trying to send some very sort of strong signal to NATO to get out of the conflict. Um, then I think that they would probably not escalate all the way to nuclear before doing the more intermediate levels uh, of weapons of mass destruction. Uh, just because the nuclear taboo, which is the non-use of nuclear weapons since World War II, is so entrenched, um, and it would lead to a situation, well, it would lead to such a situation of uncertainty as we've never experienced in any of our lifetimes. So I think even Russia would hesitate to cross that threshold. Um, so are they bluffing? I don't know. It's the rational thing to do in the situation to bluff, but it's also the rational thing to do to make fairly decisive threats. Um, one, uh, uh, one silver lining is that you do want to sort of make these sort of bold threats when you're intending to negotiate because it strengthens your negotiating position. So uh, a silver lining might be that they're making these threats with the intention uh, of trying to reach a more negotiated settlement more quickly. Um, there's no point in making threats if you're planning to fight for the next five years because you're going to act on those threats anyway. The, the role of a threat is to try to reach a negotiated solution. I don't see any other hands up. Are there any other questions? Um, Alina? Thanks for your lecture, based on the above. How do you think the diplomatic settlement of international relations will change after the war in Ukraine? Thank you. How do I think a diplomatic settlement uh, will change after the war in Ukraine? Uh, what sort of settlement? Do you mind sorry, clarifying, Alina, what sort of diplomatic settlement, settlement do you mean? I'm not sure, she, perhaps she can't hear me. Um, I, I think it's probably safe to assume that the American post-war liberal order uh, is going to be changing in the years ahead. That it was built um, for the Cold War and the 1990s and the 2000s. And probably the war in Ukraine uh, is, uh, and the aggressions that we've seen by the Chinese in the past uh, five or six years are probably heralding a, a decisive shift in the rules-based international order. Uh, what comes next, I think, will probably be a more of a return to spheres of influence. That's just my impression. My uh, Again, take that with a huge grain of salt. Uh, predictions are usually wrong. But my prediction is that we'll probably see an emerging multipolarity, which means an emerging return to more traditional spheres of influence in international relations, rather than a single international community uh, presided over by the United States uh, with, well, for, I don't know if y'all perceive it this way, but I perceive it as more or less benign leadership. I think that era is probably coming to an end. Whatever happens in Ukraine. Other questions? Um, yes, Irina. Uh, yes, thank you very much for your election. Uh, it's very good theoretical ground for our, but our students want to be more practical, I think, because they have such special situation. But I want to, uh, to ask you a such question, maybe with uh, several theoretical background. Uh, you talked about the balance of power, but we know that there are such theory as the balance of threats. 
maybe uh, the post-war in Ukraine, in the, our region, uh, all over the world uh, will be based on the balance of threats, uh, threats as the usual, uh, traditional and non-traditional. And how mm -hmm. do you think it can be changed in such a way? Yes, well, that, that's a terrific question. Um, you must pardon me a little bit. In the game theoretic literature, we sort of just push them together when we put them into the equations. But in the larger literature, yes, the balance of threat um, I think is a decisive improvement over the old ideas of the balance of power. Uh, it's the idea that you don't just look at who's the more powerful country and balance against them, otherwise everybody in the world would be balanced against the United States. But in fact, most people seem to be okay with American leadership in the international system. Uh, instead, they tend to balance threats. And I think that's certainly true in Eastern Europe, that the most powerful country in the region would, will continue to be the United States in some ways, but they will continue to fear Russia. Why? For obvious reasons. Russia has been terribly aggressive against its neighbors, even when it doesn't invade them. It pushes them around with like free trade, with coercive free trade agreements in Central Asia. Um, and then, of course, taking territory from countries like Georgia uh, and Ukraine. And so I think that uh, you'd continue to see that uh, a movement towards Europe, a movement towards America uh, throughout Eastern Europe, uh, and even with the Caucasus. I, I think that uh, the United States has mistreated Georgia in our long-term relationship, that we've often sort of like dangled the opportunity to join the West and never actually given them, made good on that promise. But I think even despite the fact that we haven't made good on the promise, they will continue to, to try to, to join up there. Now, I think there will actually be a shift of Turkey further towards Russia, which I think is very dangerous because and Turkey's in, is in NATO. Um, and that could cause serious, that could seriously call into question certain elements of the American world order. And I think the reason for that is that Turkey sees its threats in the region, it sees Russia as a partner against those threats and it's, and it's near abroad. And that's gonna be a real problem for American foreign policy going forward. So yes, by and large, balance of threat against Russia, but with the exception of one of, most, of America's most important strategic partners might actually be shifting more towards Russia. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Uh, Jana. Я сьогодні не даю вам спокою зі запитаннями. У мене таке питання щодо Китаю. Ми помітили те, що вони нейтрально відносяться до питання війни. Вони і не заперечують того, що не треба цього робити, але й не підтримують відкрито. У мене питання, чи є можливо такий варіант в плані того, щоб Китай підтримував Росію не лише через економічні зв'язки, а ще в плані того, щоб війна з Україною російська відволікала б від того, що Китай намагається повернути собі території Тайвані. Чи можливо такий фактор того, що вони просто підтримують певним чином Росію задля того, щоб просто е, відвернути увагу від проблеми з Тайванем і досить часто з'являються новини, що вони намагаються повернути Тайвань і військовим шляхом. Чи є такий варіант розвитку подій? Дякую. Yes, that is very possible. I think it's on. So first you said that China is neutral. I think it's uh, worth remembering that the word neutrality, um, technically America is neutral as well. We're not in the war, but obviously we aren't neutral. Uh, we're very clearly on the side of Ukraine in this conflict, as is most of Europe. Um, so China, of course, is technically neutral, but I think it's safe to say that it is pretty clearly on the Russian side of things, uh, on, the, on the Russian side of the ledger. Uh, why are they doing this? I, Russia, China clearly intends to challenge American preeminence in the century ahead. Um, they certainly have, they are projected to pass our economy sometime in the next 10 years. Those projections, uh, thankfully, have been toned down in the last, I think, just last couple of months. Um, but they do expect to pass us economically. Uh, they, they hope to become the first power, the greatest power in the world. I think it's entirely reasonable to think that they are setting themselves up for some sort of long-term conflict with America. And it makes sense that if you, if Russia is somewhere around the third or fourth most powerful country in the world, that they would want that country on their team. And so they're probably willing to give some sort of support uh, to this Russian action to ensure later Russian support for whatever they're doing. Will China invade Taiwan? Um, God forbid. If China invades Taiwan, I think there's a, a, a significant risk of World War III happening. Uh, not huge risk, maybe uh, probably less than 10%, but a 10% risk of World War III is something that could risk sending us all back to the state. Um, I think that's, 
I think, uh, I think it is a non-zero possibility that China will make a move against Taiwan in the coming years. Um, but I think that that is such a, a terrible situation to contemplate that it, it's almost too terrifying even to consider. Um, there is a famous line from, from the era of Mao with, I forget the exact number, but they said like in 75 years, uh, we, we can leave Taiwan alone for 75 years or whatever. And um, I think it was during the Nixon or the Reagan administrations, uh, a leader quoted this like, oh, you're fine with Taiwan. You don't care about it for 75 years. And the leader said, the Chinese counterpart said, no, it's 68 now. So I think that uh, the Chinese have been counting down for a long time about when they expect to get Taiwan back. And we probably are getting uh, towards the end of that clock. Um, to be quite honest, that terrifies me. I think there's, uh, that's a situation where, which has no good outcome for anyone. And it frightens me that it could be so likely. Not to, I don't, I don't mean to, to, to be alarmist there. Again, I don't think the, I think the probability of China invading Taiwan is less than 15%. I think the probability of that leading to World War III is less than 10%. But 10% times 10% is still 1%. And a 1% risk of World War III um, is, a, is, a, is a cataclysm such as humanity has never experienced. Um, the people who make these calculations about existential risk, it's a community that I'm involved in, um, currently ex estimate the risk of some sort of existential disaster, either a nuclear war or some side of, of massive AI catastrophe at around, one in, uh, uh, at around one in six. I think that number is too high, but even if it's off by an order of magnitude so that it's one in 60, that's still a rather frighteningly high percentage. Other questions or thoughts on the lecture or anything? Well, I, I think we have to um, end at this point. Thank you for all the questions. I think it was a great success. Richard will begin his class uh, at Baylor in about 15 minutes. minutes. So we have to let him go. But Richard, thanks so much for your time and for your excellent lecture. and. Um, Всім вдячний за вашу присутність і за ваші запитання. І сподіваюся вас побачити наступного тижня. І ми будемо говорити про причини війни з точки зору конструктивістських теорій, де, я думаю, ви побачите більше паралелей в поясненнях з тим, що відбувається зараз. It was my pleasure. Uh, thank, you for, uh, thank you for your attention. And I would just say that God be with you. And our prayers are with you as well. Thank you very much for wonderful lecture uh, and answers uh, and all. My pleasure. Good. Uh, Y'all take care. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.